The suspect in this case, Andrew Lester, claims the shooting was in self-defense and told police he was scared to death. It's raised questions about Missouri's stand your ground law and whether it will come into play as this case unfolds. 18 states have those so-called stand your ground laws, which basically allows someone to use deadly force to protect against imminent death or serious bodily harm. Now, the law became widely criticized after successfully being used in defense of the 2012 killing of another black teen, of course, Trayvon Martin. Missouri and 19 other states also have a type of standard ground law called the Castle Doctrine, which gives people the right to defend themselves at their home or in another place they have a right to be. To talk more about this, we want to bring in Jamila Jefferson Jones, a professor and associate dean for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at University of Kansas School of Law. Professor, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. So the suspect in this case claims he was scared, felt threatened, but the prosecutor has said there is a racial component to this case. What do you make uh, of his self-defense argument? Well, you have to be reasonably threatened. You have to have a reasonable belief, and that's part of what's missing here. Um, young Ralph did not pose any sort of reasonable um, threat to Mr. Lester. He rang the doorbell. If Ralph's ringing the doorbell is threatening, then anyone's ringing the doorbell is threatening. And that really would um, be a problem for mail deliverers and the pizza guy and everyone else. Um, so I do believe that there's a racial component. There was some mention um, of uh, Mr. Lester saying, well, that he was black. Um, that can't be the what is threatening. That can't be the only thing that is threatening. He has to have done something. So Ralph just rang this doorbell, um, and this gentleman thought of him as a threat. And part of the problem is this idea that force can be used to remove black people from spaces that some white people believe they don't belong in. And so this man saw this young black boy in this neighborhood, thought he didn't belong there, and use deadly force to try to remove him from the area. Hmm. And that's such a, uh, and that, that's why this case has, has struck a nerve because I think people who are outraged by what they saw said, you know, believe that the only reason you pulled the trigger was because he was a young black teen. That's what you found threatening about him, his blackness. And if that is what we learn as this case moves forward is his fear of, of of, of this young man just because of his blackness, does that in any way then constitute a hate crime? Because right now he's facing two felony counts, including assault, which does carry a sentence of up to life in prison. So it's a serious crime. But is there a hate element that comes to play here at all, considering there was nothing threatening that this young man was doing other than ringing the doorbell like the Amazon or pizza guy would? Well, so that has to be looked into, and I believe that the federal authorities are looking into that now. It is a question, um, and if, if, if this was done because of racial animus, then yes, it would be a hate crime. And so that's being investigated at this point. You're an expert in property law. Um, what can you tell us about specifically Missouri's stand your ground law and how it's going to fit into this case? So I'm not an expert in the stand your ground law, but I'll tell you that it is the opposite of the duty to retreat. So in some states, when you're threatened, you have a duty to retreat if you're able to do so safely. In stand your ground laws, you do not have to abide by a duty to retreat if you have a reasonable, reasonable belief that you are being threatened with imminent harm. The problem here, again, we have to go back to this idea of reasonableness. Um, there's also the Castle Doctrine, which says that you do not have to retreat and you can defend um, yourself in a place where you have a right to be. And clearly Mr. Lester had a right to be at his home. But again, we have to go back to reasonableness and whether there was any reasonable threat. Um, and there is a question. Um, I, I believe that there's nothing that said that, that Ralph uh, entered the home. No, he just rang the doorbell, um, right? Instead, he rang the doorbell. So this should not apply um, in Mr. Lester's case. <laughs> Let me ask you this. 
it, do you see any, whether it's the Castle argument or the Stand Your Ground argument, do you see a successful defense in either one of those things? And in layman's terms, can you break down the difference? I'm having trouble understanding. It seems to be the same general principle. You can defend yourself with a gun. Uh, that, that's basically what, if you feel threatened, that's kind of what it all comes down to, no matter the, the name we put on it. But is there a fine line that I'm missing between the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground Law? And do you think either one of them are applicable, is applicable uh, to this particular case? I don't think either is applicable, but the difference is um, Castle is place-based. So if you have a right to be in that place, your home or some other place, then you have the right to defend there. Um, the stand your ground law um, would apply broadly no matter where you are. Um, it just says that you don't have to retreat, um, which normally you would have a duty to retreat because the idea would be to keep others from being harmed. You want to, even though you may feel threatened, if there's a way to diffuse um, the situation by retreating, then that's what you have to do. So um, that's the difference. There's a slight difference in place. But if you think back to um, to April of 2018, where you had white folk calling the cops on black folk for just being, for living while black, this is a, a version of that. And this is also a version of, of of the Trayvon Martin case with regard to stand your ground, but it's also what leads up to, um, or what happens when people are empowered to remove racial minorities through the threat of force from places that they don't think they ought to be. North Kansas City, where this happened, is a very um, diverse area. Uh, Ralph is a member of the Liberian American community that lives up there, and there's all sorts of people in North Kansas City. Um, it's demographically changing. And it's possible that this man has not caught up with those demographic changes and feels threatened by the changes around him um, and could not have imagined that Ralph had a legitimate reason for being in the, in the area, even though Ralph, of course, had every legitimate reason for being there. And his family describes him as, uh, describes him as five foot eight, 140 pounds. So when he's talk about threatening, um, you know that his physical appearance plays a role. And, and real quick, just briefly, a lot has been made too about the cops not pursuing the shooter in the case until there were protests, until there were national news cameras and microphones in in that community asking what is going on here. How do you read the tea leaves in terms of the time lapse? and perhaps the motivation, uh, that uh, the waiting game a little bit before the cops actually pursued the shooter as a potential criminal? I think there are a lot of questions there, um, and those need to be answered. We have a new police chief, and she's going to have to answer those questions um, because it's not clear why uh, Mr. Lester was let go so quickly um, and why this case wasn't pursued in the first place without the public pressure. But I'm so grateful for those who protested, grateful for the community generally, and um, also for the Liberian American community in Kansas City that is keeping pressure on, on the government to make sure that Ralph has justice. And uh, we are grateful for your time and your insight. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Please come back as this case continues to, uh, to unfold. We appreciate you being with us. I would love to. Thank you for having me. And Lindsay.